Hi, Dr. Schluter. Thanks for taking the time. You're welcome. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. So you're a professor of philosophy and religion at Hillsdale College. I've been wanting to have someone from Hillsdale College on the podcast for a while now. I've always been fascinated uh, by the place. I read an article, a long article in the New York Times about Hillsdale College, and uh, it's, it's a place that's been on my radar for a while. So tell me briefly before we get into Plato, what brought you to, to Hillsdale College um, and, and what's it like to teach there? And maybe, maybe then you could also tell me um, while you're at it, uh, what, what area of philosophy do you specialize in and, and what are the sorts of courses you teach at Hillsdale? So I'll, I'll give you the abridged story there. I went to graduate school because I was I had large interests. I was interested in literature. I was interested in politics. I was interested in philosophy. I was interested in theology, and I was interested on how and how all of those are connected to one another. And so that's what I looked for in graduate school. And the only graduate school that existed at the time that offered that kind, an education for that kind of interest was the University of Dallas, which has a PhD program in literature, politics, and philosophy, and the different disciplines all take core classes together, uh, structured around the great books. So that's why I went to graduate school, and that's what I was looking for in a teaching position. And Hillsdale is one of the few small liberal arts colleges it still offers what at one time i think was a standard kind of education with a core curriculum a, a mandate a, a sort of prescriptive core curriculum organized around uh, great texts and one which constantly sort of sought to promote conversation across the disciplines towards great questions that all those disciplines share. So I'm very grateful to be at Hillsdale, to be at a school which still takes that kind of education seriously. And I'm surrounded by colleagues that I admire and respect who share my interests and are very bright, bringing their own specialized knowledge to those questions. I learned so much from them. And I'm surrounded by great students. And I tell the students on the first day of class, my freshmen, you're smarter than me, you're just ignorant, <laughs> which, is not, which is not meant to be an insult to them. It's meant to kind of inspire them. They're really, really smart kids, and they know that they don't know enough yet, but they're really eager to learn. Right. And so it's really a delight to be, to be in that position to help them and... Um, so that's what it's like to be here. It's it's really, I feel like it's a place that really reinforces my vocation. Yeah, so uh, one thing I wanted to touch on there, there's this um, attitude, I think, that's prevalent right now. It's it's something I've talked about with my colleagues. And, and some of my colleagues have this notion that, um, th they say this all the time, students learn differently. Students learn differently now. They learn differently now. And my response is always, well, students have different tools that they use to learn now, but I actually don't think that very much about human nature has changed in the last hundred years. Um, so is there something special about the way the sort of the great books, primary source, um, Socratic method that you guys use at Hillsdale College? Do you think that that is still in the, in the 21st century a relevant and important way to teach? It's a great question and obviously a big question. I do think that the change in technologies for delivering education have been very consequential. There's still a lot of questioning about the effectiveness of those forms of learning. I'm inclined to think that more traditional ways of delivering an education, increasingly it's, it's becoming clear that you just can't really replace the intimate personal contact that goes on in the yeah. classroom and that you cannot really replace the kind of furnishing of the mind that can occur by encountering great minds through great books. So another thing I tell my students on the first day of class is I'm not your teacher. 
in this semester and they look at me with kind of open eyes what, what do you mean am I in the wrong section poor freshmen sometimes they are <laughs> but uh, no your teachers are going to be Plato and Aristotle and Shakespeare oh, that's and great. Dante and others uh, I'm just your tour guide really uh, I it would be presumptuous of me to think that I can teach you better than they can but what I can do after a long experience with these great minds is to show you show you how to notice things how to pay attention to things and to learn yourself to be able to teach yourself I, I'm platonic in this respect that I see education not as putting ideas into an empty mind right. but as turning the soul towards the true, the good, and the beautiful. There's a turning process that happens that's very intimate and interior in particular to each student. And so they have to go through that process, each one for him or herself. Now, I will say this, though, that Hillsdale's a little different than some other schools. On, on, one, on one side of the spectrum, you have something like a St. John's College in which it's a very uniform, very rigorous seminar style education in which um, the role of the tutor is is really minimized the tutor really is meant to be just a facilitator with each individual's encounter with that text and Hillsdale is not quite like that we leave a lot more room for the teacher to play to his or her strengths that's great um, so some are more comfortable with with lecturing, giving context, background, some are more comfortable with sitting sitting down in a seminar room and just forcing the students to wrestle all alone with what's going on in the text. And some do something that's a little more in between those two. And I guess that's my style. I think it's really important for them to have context. They do need human nature being what it is, in my view. Those books are not uh, you, you can't just abstract them and insulate them from the whole context, historical and even literary context in which they exist. So I try to give a lot of context Great. while also encouraging their own reflection and engagement with it. Fantastic. I agree with that, and that's very inspiring. Actually, watching some of those Hillsdale videos, the good, the beautiful, and the true, were very inspiring. Right. I just featured Hillsdale in a, we're doing a guide to Great Books Colleges, and so I spent about 15 minutes talking about Hillsdale. I want to get to Plato. Uh, so as you know, we're just getting started doing our episodes on Plato. With you, I'd like to hone in on Plato's Republic. So the Republic is uh, Plato's major philosophical work. It's his attempt to describe what the ideal state would be like. But I think, for me, the, the Republic is kind of an astonishing book for the ideas that it explores. Um, the Republic just asks so many important questions. You know, what is justice? What is knowledge? What's the best form of government? How should citizens be educated? Are men equal? Why do we have to obey laws? Uh, you know, do different people have different roles in society, etc. I always love revisiting Plato's allegory of the cave, his myth of the metals, the tripartite theory of the soul and state. And so I'm convinced that the Republic is a great work of Western literature. But from an expert, I, I'd like to know, why should we still be reading Plato's Republic? Why, why should my students, for example, read uh, Plato's Republic? You've done a nice job hitting many of the reasons I'm I'm partial, I suppose, but partial for reasons. I think Plato's Republic, in some sense, rules the entire Western philosophical tradition, um, maybe alongside a, a few steps below, if you will, the Bible, which is the book, right? It's right. hard to beat the book. <laughs> uh, but uh, setting, a, setting aside the book just for a moment... Uh, Plato's Republic, I think, has to come in there as the monumental work of of, of our tradition. And the, part of the reason is uh, not just because of all of the things that you mentioned, which I think are so richly there, but because of the way in which it integrates those things. So the Republic slowly and carefully unfolds for the reader the connection what why is it, 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 it sort of begins with a very practical 
uh, down-to-earth set of problems. That's where it starts. And what that people can acknowledge or recognize as in some way parallel to the conversations they might have mm. uh, over a Thanksgiving turkey or whatever else. Um, th- th- those very basic conversations begin, but as they go under the guidance of Socrates, we are brought into the sort of deepest human questions where metaphysics and ethics and aesthetics and politics are all being drawn upon and connected. And so it's, it's, it's the great book because it's not just about one thing. Plato's dialogues tend to be each one focused on one particular topic. What is virtue? What is love? Right. It takes these different questions. But the question, what is justice, somehow in, uh, unpacking that unfolds all these other questions. I also think it's just a radically relevant book. It's so timely in so many ways. There's this view out there that dead white males are locked into their own particular time and place and gender and race and whatever else that we're all locked into these categories. Yeah, there's a very sectional, that, sectional, intersectional, uh, fragmenting sort of moralism going on right now. Exactly, and and it's partly why the great books aren't studied anymore because of the because of that ideology. Well, they're designed to lift us out of that tribalism. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's exactly right. I mean, they are they are the thing that did that. The the discovery of nature, if you will, was the precondition for being able to transcend uh, the things that we see as obstacles today. So what we're seeing today, strangely, in attacking the Western civilization, made possible really by the West, is a return to a tribalism. But in the Republic, so radically, you, you get, I think, the most radical defense, for example, of feminism beyond what was imagined even until the 20th century and you get a severe (laughs) critique of aristocracy by birth you get a severe critique of paternalism this we're talking fifth century bc here fourth fifth century bc the plato is showing us the possibilities for these claims of justice he's also showing us i think the difficulties in, ma- in making those things your focal point of justice. So he's reminding us what the obstacles are in human nature to achieving, if you will, if, if those things, achieving perfect justice. So this book is sometimes considered to be a work of maybe the first work of utopian fiction. And it's sometimes accused of eliciting utopian longings and desire which inevitably become dystopian longings and desire because once you start longing for a perfect political regime on earth and you start really wanting that to happen uh that can encourage cruelty and violence in order to achieve that ideal so the republic is sometimes associated with those things but i think what it actually is is a therapy for utopian longing it both shows us the roots of utopian longing but then shows us what would have to be done to realize this. And so it ends up remind, I think, being a kind of stern warning against utopianism, precisely by doing that, not by preventing us from seeing those ideals out there, by showing us what those are, but by showing us also what it is in human nature that makes those ideals impossible and possibly even dangerous. So I read it actually as an anti-utopian work of fiction, and I, you know, and I call that an, a work of fiction. There, I think that's really notable. Why is that? Yeah. So this, to me, is really important. Why is it that Plato only writes dialogues? Mm. And what is a dialogue? It's striking to compare, and my students do compare the style of Plato to Aristotle, for example. And Aristotle is writing treatises. They read like academic lectures that students are maybe more accustomed to. Whereas from the get-go, in in, in Plato's dialogues, you get a list of dramatis personae. 
you know, they're, they're these persons of the drama, mm-hmm. and you get then those persons uh, in conversation with often a setting and an action. They're in a particular place or in a particular time. A question is raised. They're referring to previous events. The, the text itself reads like a work of fiction. And that raises great questions, like why does Plato r- embed his philosophy in fiction if that's what he's doing? And that is actually a cue, it seems to me, that we needed to pay close attention to it as a work of fiction. That is, we need to pay attention to the characters, to the drama, to the conversation, the historical context. Mm. And we're warned then, I think, not to simply l- try to lift the philosophical claims abstractly out of the text and to universalize them and make them a kind of Platonism, gotcha. which is really what I think Neoplatonism does. Hmm. When you get into the Neoplatonic period, Platonism has become hardened into a whole metaphysical picture Whereas in the dialogues themselves, that picture is presented much more playfully, Mm. much more contingently, much more speculatively, with an attention to actual human beings who are trying to understand this. And so I think it's really important to recover Plato as as philosophical literature, if you will. Uh, And that's how we read it in my class. We're we're very attentive from the get-go. I mean, the, the, the characters in the first book of Plato's Republic are so colorful. That they're delineated with so much color. Mm-hmm. You, get, you get Cephalus, the old man, who's coming in from the sacrifices with a wreath on his head, <laughs> and he's talking about how difficult old age is, right. and they have this wonderful conversation about aging. And then you get his son who jumps into the conversation, and Cephalus leaves, and his son... There's a little bit of anxiety about this question of justice because he's the one who's inheriting the wealth, and he's a little worried about whether his wealth is justified. And they have this conversation, and then, of course, this character Thrasymachus <laughs> comes in and he's described like a lion, like a wild beast, <laughs> and everyone's holding him back, and he's listening very impatiently. Undergraduates can imagine this. Right. Some right. of them are like this. So <laughs> yeah. I said, you, you've had your late night dorm room conversations. Do you know any Thrasymachuses? Yeah. Some of them blush because they are the Thrasymachus. They can't patiently sit in a conversation when they hear things that they think are ridiculous. They're just so eager to jump in and assert what they know to be true. And they want to be heard. And they think they've got the answers. So Thrasymachus right. jumps in like a wild beast. And we all know people like this. Oh, I'm like that. I told my yeah. students this because we're, we're, we're not up to the Republic yet in my philosophy class. Uh, we started with ethics. And so now we're, we're using uh, Socrates and Plato to get to launch us into metaphysics. So we're about to do the Republic. But I was teaching hey. them the Socratic method. And uh, I was just trying to describe the patience that it takes to be Socrates, to use like reductio ad absurdum and to ask these narrowing, these gradual narrowing questions that eventually befuddle uh, your interlocutor. And I said, I can't do it because I want I want to prove my opponent wrong by saying something right. affirmative right away. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's a, that's a great self-observation, and I share it. It's, 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 it, it, it's my own self-knowledge as well as a teacher, because Socrates is a consummate teacher. Yeah. And what he knows he needs to do is get Thrasymachus in a place where he will shut up and listen. Mm-hmm. And so he doesn't just start off giving a discourse on justice. He lets Thrasymachus do that. And so Thrasymachus thinks he knows, and he begins to sort of ask questions of Thrasymachus. And it turns out Thrasymachus can't really give a coherent account of the thing that he thinks is justice. So can you frame that de- that debate that they have? What th- That's a very famous moment in the Republic, and it comes early on. What are they, what are they wrestling about? So Thrasymachus jumps in. Uh, there's there's a prior argument about uh, what is justice, and Socrates uh, wants to initially show. Initially, Cephalus says Cephalus or Cephalus, depending on which 
pronunciation you want to want to use argues that justice is telling the truth and giving back what one owes. Right. And so Socrates locks in on to giving back what one owes, and he says, "Well, what does that mean exactly? Uh, so does that mean that if you give someone a weapon, someone's entrusted with a weapon, and they?" come back asking for the weapon and you know that they're planning to do harm or violence with that weapon are you obliged to give it back to them? Right. and it's a famous kind of question and that's precisely the point where Keflis says uh, no I don't think so and so Socrates says what's, so giving back what one owes can't be just giving back what people have and by the way that's a funny moment with my Hillsdale students who are to come in pretty committed to property rights and to the Second Amendment. Right. And I tell them, okay, Socrates has just uh, gotten you to rethink <laughs> to some degree what it means to have a right to private property and especially your weapons. Sure. Because he's just, how many of you, and I ask him this every year, if your friend borrows a gun from you and then he, uh, your friend loans you his gun and then he comes back and he's just out of his mind and he says give me my gun back I'm going to go shoot someone Do you, are you obliged to give him a gun back and not one in ten years has said yes Right. but I say it's his gun right you know look what you it's his property number one and it's his gun number two you don't think so why not Why are you, so, and, and, and so that leads you to think that property rights and weapons might be contingent upon having a certain kind of knowledge and moral virtue and responsibility. Sure. And suddenly that becomes kind of a dangerous question mm. because, wow, how are we to measure that? How are we to evaluate who is responsible enough or wise enough or virtuous enough to have, possess property, especially weapons? You know, so that set of unresolved questions. So Thrasymachus is getting fierce. Now, Thrasymachus... Um, by the question he asks, what he comes in is he says, "You guys are all just." This is typical of Socrates. He asks questions. He doesn't say what justice is. He's very frustrated. He's one of these people who likes clear answers, and, and so many people are like this, right? right? Why am I Why am I reading this book, asking all these questions without telling me what to think? I just want <laughs> yeah. a neat black and white answer. But he thinks he's got the answer, and he says, "I'll tell you what it is, but you're going to have to pay me." Which is striking, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's a kind of clue for classicists that Thersimachus is a sophist. Sophist, yeah. Which means that he is a professional teacher who takes money to educate young men about how to succeed in politics. Right, how to use rhetoric to, 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 uh, to gain power, basically. Exactly, particularly to use rhetoric. And so Socrates is just so brilliant, right? He says, I don't have any money. Because <laughs> um, he doesn't value money. He values wisdom. So his friends say, we'll pitch in, we'll pay if he can give a good account. So go ahead, Thrasymachus. And so Thrasymachus gives his definition in which he simply says, justice is the advantage of the stronger. Right. That's all it is. It's the advantage of the stronger. And so Socrates goes through some uh, gymnastics, one of them being, there are several, but one of them just obviously being, well, what if... Uh, so this is someone, might makes right, correct? Well, that, that's the argument he makes, that's right. Might makes right. Socrates asks the question, well, what if the person with might doesn't know, makes a mistake about his, about his advantage? Right. What if he thinks something's his advantage, but it really isn't? And Thrasymachus you know, goes through his set of answers, you know, replies to this. But it, if you, if, I always ask my students to outline the argument. What, what are the premises? What, what, what are the problems with the argument that Socrates is bringing up? And it turns out it's, it gets kind of convoluted. And the thing that Thrasymachus cannot let go of is that he's an expert in his art of rhetoric. And he's also an expert in, but given his definition, knowing his own advantage. And these two kinds of knowledge end up being intention. So what I want to say here to you, which is important, is that 
Socrates in his arguments with Thrasymachus is not entirely fair. What he wants to do is to get Thrasymachus to just kind of be quiet for a moment, to at least come to a place where he says, I don't really know. I don't right. know the answer. Right. It's, it's more complicated than I thought. So he uses some strategies that are, th that to the students look very sophistic, actually. That they look like the kind of thing a sophist would do. And at the end of that, Thrasymachus blushes, which is a brilliant little move. It says, you know, I saw something I never saw before. Thrasymachus blushed. It's just one line. And I say to my students, what a brilliant line. Yeah. What, is, what does it mean to blush? Me Nietzsche describes, defines man at a certain point as the beast with red cheeks. Or, you know, that's not the conventional definition of man, but what does it take to blush? Right. It takes a conscience, at least in part. It takes a kind of awareness, a sh sense of shame, the sorts of things. No other animal blushes, only man blushes. Right. And it means that he has reason in some f sense. And his reason can be corrected. Anyhow, Thrasymachus, he gets Thrasymachus to be quiet. But at the, at the end of book one, Socrates says, I was a glutton. I just sort of went after all the desserts here. I jumped at all these arguments and made them, but I don't really quite know if I believe them. And I'm really not any further along in knowing what justice is than when I began. And so you, you get the sense at the end of book one that it's been a kind of brilliant car crash. Um, it's, it's had all these fireworks in it. And th th there's been these moments of brilliant insight. But at the end of it, what have we accomplished? Well, he did. He did knock down a pretty scary argument, the idea that might makes right. And then, he, as you pointed out, he says that basically, you know, those in power can make mistakes. And if, if they can make mistakes, they can make laws that are not in their own interest. And right. to obey those laws is not to act in the interest, interest of those in power. And then, he, you know, thus, to be just is to do what is in the interest of those in power and to be justice to do what is not in the interest of those. So you're right, it's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, he, he hits these various contradictions in Thrasymachus, but, but the striking thing is, it seems to me, that at the, at the very beginning of book two then, book one could have just ended the Republic. Right. But at book two, Socrates is, is, is with this guy named um, Glaucon at the beginning of the Republic. Mm. Again, he and Glaucon go down to the Piraeus, which is this port city in Athens, where there's a new festival. It's just a brilliant setting. Every detail matters. And I, w I won't go into that, but you know, it's something you, your listeners should know. Every detail is just saturated with meaning in this book. Mm. So he's with Glaucon at the beginning, and Glaucon comes in at the beginning of book two, and he says, Socrates, do you, do, do you really want to persuade us, or do you just want to seem to have persuaded us? And Socrates says, well, I really want to persuade you. And Glaucon then shows why he is the deeper thinker than Thrasymachus. Because he says, well, Thrasymachus, he didn't make the argument very well, but he's got a really good point. I, I, I hear all these people say that tyranny really is the best thing. Like if, if you could really get everything you desired, you know, all the women, all the money, all the power, everyone really would want that. The only reason they don't pursue it is because they might get found out. Right. You know, they, they might get ashamed. You know, if, if they could do this without being discovered, deep down, that's what people would want. And so he goes through the arguments that I'm sure you know, using, say, the Ring of Gaijus. Ring of Gaijus, right? yeah. This, again, this sort of brilliant little imaginative device for getting us to sort of deeply understand human nature. If you could have an invisibility ring, hmm. how would you act? Right. And I kind of wink at my students. Did you ever hear of an invisibility ring? Wink, wink. <laughs> uh, yeah, they all, all my students, at least at Hillsdale, are big Tolkien fans. Right, so right. They, they immediately make that connection. I say, oh, it's interesting, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, Glaucon presents the uh, uh, just amazing defense of tyranny. And then his brother jumps in and and, and compliments that by, by adding various things to it. So that at the end, Socrates, boy, he, say, he says after he hears them, boy, you guys, I'm surprised you're not tyrants. 
you've made such a good argument. You must have really good character to see how persuasive the case is for tyranny, but to not be pursuing it. But these are really important arguments. <laughs> I don't know really how to defend myself perfectly, but it would be impious of me not to try, which I think is a striking choice of words. Because if you remember, Socrates is put to death for impiety by the city of Athens. Right. And that's sort of the singular event that haunts the entire dialogue. It's written after the death of Socrates, but it's set before his death. Mm. And what Plato seems to be saying is, Socrates did not corrupt Athens. Right. Athens was already in bad shape. They were already inviting these foreign gods in, and look at Thrasymachus and the defense he's making of justice as might makes right, and then look at what even good people like Glaucon are making because they're hearing it from everyone else. Right. That is, you a very, you've got a very dangerous ideology that's already permeating Athenian culture. And Socrates says it would be impious of me not to come to the defense of justice. So it seems to me very likely that Plato's Republic is really Plato's true defense of Socrates. Not the defense he's forced to give in front of the Athenian assembly, where he's just awkward. Right, right. He just, he just, it's not his way of conversing. He doesn't think the sort of compelled sorts of witness arguments that you get in a law court are the sorts of venues in which truth, time, in any deep sense can be done. Gotcha, yeah. And so Plato's apology is really uh, interesting in lots of other ways, but not because you're getting... <clears throat> Socrates, Plato's deepest defense and understanding of who Socrates is. So, so well, one of the things the, whole rest of the Republic. Yeah, one of the things that I love about the Apology, if I remember, it's been a really long time, but uh, and I could have this wrong, but I remember there there being some kind of defense uh, on the part of Socrates where he says something like, "The philosopher should have the right to put things out there." that there's a sense in which um, it's actually really important to be able to put put ideas out there to test them out uh, and and ping pong them off someone else to try to figure out what's true. Do I have that anywhere near right? <laughs> well, yeah, that may be there. Um, what, what stands out to me in his defense is that, it, it, again, it's rooted in this very particular story. Someone someone hears a rumor that Socrates is the wisest Athenian mm. and he doesn't believe it. He's like, that can't be true. I see all these other people that are wise. And so uh, this person goes to consult the oracle at Delphi and the oracle says, you know, Socrates is the wisest. Right. So he uh, decides to test that oracle. And so he goes around to test what people know. And what he discovers is that uh, he doesn't know anything more than they do, but they really think they know things, mm -hmm. whereas he kind of knows what he doesn't know. Right. And questioning people's presumption to knowledge is deeply offensive to them. Right. And especially the claim that they know what virtue is, that they know how to live well. I think it's important to see in a way that, that there is a way in which Socrates is questioning has a subversive quality to it. I mean, it, it seems to me that um, w one can argue that at least to some degree, um, a, a political regime requires people who are attached to that regime. The, the, it requires people who, patriotism, you know, if Americans are going to die for America, they need to be attached to America. They, they need to see things there that they're willing to die for. Mm -hmm. And, so you have to be careful about getting them to become just philosophics, you know, philosophically speculative about, well, you know, maybe, uh, you know, all these attachments are not really grounded in the truth, but in something very particular that's not universal. True. And, uh -huh. and, and so, I mean, here, here's where we could, you know, jump to the allegory of the cave just for a moment, because the allegory of the cave is is the very heart and center of the dialogue to a certain degree. And th that allegory is often presented 
in purely sort of pedagogical terms, right? You've got these, right? You move from sort of shadows of things to things in themselves, uh, to, to the ideas of the things, to the idea of the good and education, sort of turning and working through these. But I think the really important thing to see in that allegory is that the cave is a city. It's, it's, it's a political regime. Right, right. If you think about it as a political regime, and, and there are all kinds of hints that it's a political regime. And, the, and, and, and when Socrates leaves and gets outside the cave in the allegory, and then he has to go back in. Uh, which is itself kind of an interesting question. Why does he have to go back in? But he goes back in, and he starts telling the people about what he's seen on the outside, and, and they tell him, be quiet. Right. Um, um, shut up, and if you keep talking, we're going to kill you. <clears throat> now, these are the people that are in ch- are chained up looking at the wall of the cave. And they can't break the chains. It's just it's very unclear from the allegory of the cave that... They, they can remove themselves from the situation which they're in. How does Socrates get out? It says, if by some chance you know, his, that his chains were broken and he was compelled to turn around. Wow. Right. But we're not told what breaks the chain. We're not told who or what compels him to turn around. And the very first experience he has when he turns around is painful because he's going from a kind of light into a darkness. And that's painful to go from light to darkness. What is it in our nature that resists? I think we all know, right? None of us likes to be turned from light to darkness. And then he makes the ascent, and he goes from darkness into light, where he sees the fire uh, at at the level, at the next level. There's a Mm -hmm. fire Mm -hmm. there where there's there's various puppeteers. That hurts his eyes. It takes some accustoming, some getting accustomed to the light. And then there are these people who, wow, these are the people casting the images onto the wall of the cave. So we see that what the people chained are seeing is not really anything but the images being cast by the image makers. Right. And, and the question is, who are these image makers? Now, that's a great question. So can I ask you there? Um, yeah. I, I see where you're going with this, and, and this is great because a lot. I think I, what you said was a lot of teachers teach this as a way of talking about metaphysics, right? The idea that you know um, what you see is sort of this Kantian idea that what you see is is not really the thing in itself, right? You're filtering the world through your narrow subjectivity, and that there's a real truth out there, and then you can start talking about the forms and all of that. Um, right. You're extending that out to, and, and this is what you think um, Plato was really talking about. Uh, to the political realm, to absolutely to the to the state. Um, tell tell me about what Plato's allegory of the cave. Uh, what is what does that allegory mean politically for us? So that is the great. That this is just one of the many, just stunning images, allegories, parts of Plato's Republic that in itself could become a subject of years of reflection and meditation. Mm-hmm. So, so so let me just say this, that this is just one of the beautiful things about Plato's Republic, that the way learning, real learning happens is not just confinable to a simple definition, that there's sort of inexhaustible depths and that the imagination, in fact, can do a lot of work for philosophy. Right. Plato is an incredibly imaginative philosopher. We drive a wedge between the imagination, say the humanities on one side or something, and then philosophy, which is all about reason. But Plato refuses to do that. Mm. He sees that the imagination and reason are very closely allied. So here's an image that uh, in the image does a kind of work that would be very difficult to do independent of the image. So to, then to get to your question, I think what, what seems to be going on here um, is that uh, s- several claims seem to be embedded in the image. One of them is that uh, hu- human beings are stratified in a certain way in terms of what they know, what they can't know. That is, they're, they're, they're unequal in a certain way. They, mm-hmm. uh, and they always will be. And political life in particular is, is, cannot be then rooted in knowledge per se. It it can't simply be based upon metaphysical insight of citizens, that 
human knowledge, for the most part, begins with very concrete, particular experiences that are embedded, frankly, first and foremost, in the stories we hear. That it's the narratives and stories that begin to structure our knowledge. The mythos. The mythos, it's exactly right, which just pervades the Republic. The, the whole Republic is really about mythos and logos and how they're related to one another. And we, we can talk about that more later, but if, if, if there's time. But so, so the allegory of the cave seems to be um, that opinion or muthos is fundamental to political life. Every political regime has a story it tells about itself. And, but here's the other thing to notice about it. It's not, this is not a postmodern account, even though it's focusing on narrative, right? right. Because there is a meta narrative. Right. The meta narrative is outside the cave. You can get out there. Gotcha. Yep. But, but, but you can't build the city on the meta narrative. Right. W what you're going to have to do is take that meta narrative outside the cave. You know, ask my students, what, what do you, th if you want to change those people in the chains in the cave, you want to free them. You want to liberate them. I can see two different models. Uh, one model is to go down and just uh, just make hell down there. Break <laughs> up the chains. Bring on a bat. You know, smash the wall. And will that work? No. <laughs> right? uh, it's it's like Solzhenitsyn said: the line between good and evil runs through every human heart, yeah. or something like that. Like until you change right. human nature, those chains aren't going to do anything. Those chains are in your nature. They're, what do you need? In, really in, in Christianity, they call that soteriology, right? What you need is <laughs> soteriology, right? Abs absolutely, absolutely. Which is a work of grace in Christianity. Yeah. It's not so unless you're a Pelagian, you can't just do this yourself. You yeah. can't just pick yourself up and turn yourself around. But there's a second option. You that you, that doesn't mean you just have to leave people uh, bound to their chains, indifferent, because you got those image makers up there in that next level. Hmm. And who are those guys? Those guys, well, at, at some superficial level, uh, well, they're advertisers, right? Mm. We all know who the image makers are. Just watch us. Just watch some football today. Yeah. Watch the commercials. Yeah. Don't yeah. tell me there aren't <laughs> image makers. Yeah. Don't tell me there aren't whole departments, you know, disciplines and colleges and universities dedicated to image making. Yes. Why? To exert power over people. Yeah. To get them to desire and choose the things you want. So let's not pretend Plato's like. You know, trying to uh, do anything that we don't already do today. Mm -hmm. But if, if we concede that advertising departments have a kind of power, then we better just be frank about this. That, that so much of our political lives, our moral lives, our, say, commercial economic lives are framed by images. And then it becomes hugely important what kinds of images we are being given that's right and is it not the case and i think it clearly is the case that some images come closer to being outside the cave mm -hmm. than others mm -hmm. so not all images are created equal to uh, make a turn of phrase in the declaration of independence um so presumably what the people outside the cave can do they can go in and, and you know break up the whole thing and that's what you have in the French Revolution right I think exactly you break all the chains you create chaos uh, another option is to become a great image maker to work at the level level of images what images can I cast upon this wall that are gonna do the most to liberate those people in chains to see in and through the image towards something like what's outside the cave how can I draw them out as far as possible through the image. So what I tell my students is not all caves are created equal. You know, if every political regime is a cave, not all caves are equally cave-like. Right. Because the muthos of the cave can have more or less logos in it. Right. And my view is that America is a, is a is a, is a muthos that's deeply permeated by logos. Right. That is, we have a muthos which tells us there's a logos. Yeah, and, and you can't a, get to the logos without the mythos. Per, precisely. That is exactly it. But what a claim to make, right? Right. What, what, what a claim to make in light of, if that's true, 
then the whole way we taught, we do philosophy today <laughs> is off. The whole thing's off. And the way we do literature is off because we hermetically seal these things from each other. Right. Like literature is all about, you know, uh, creativity and imaginative, um, you know, constructions, which, you know, depending on which English departments you're talking about are be, being deconstructed. Whereas philosophy is all about uh, sort of rational asking of questions. But Plato is giving us only literary dialogues in which he wants to show us that philosophy, that, that muthos and logos are fundamental to human flourishing. And we've got to see how they're united in our lives. Oh, this uh, whole conversation here is reminding me of, you sent me uh, some information about uh, what uh, version of Plato's Republic I should read. And I was really happy that you said the Alan Bloom one, because that was the one that I had. And um, <clears throat> I had not read Alan Bloom's version. I'm slogging my way through it now. It's beautiful. Um, and I'm, I'm taking this quote that I want to read to you, and I want, to, I want you to respond to this, if you can, um, from the essay at the end, his famous essay at the end. And what you're saying reminds me of this quote. He says, The Republic is Plato's defense of philosophy. The philosopher studies nature, particularly the heavens, and there he finds a true account of the celestial phenomena differing widely from that given in the religious myths. For example, he learns of a purely mechanical explanation of Zeus's thunderbolt. The philosopher's contemplation of the heavens dissolves the perspective of the city, the laws of which now seem to be mere conventions with no natural status. His way of life turns him from the duties of citizenship, and what he learns teaches him to despise the human political things. What is more, the philosopher's understanding of the causes of all things makes it impossible for him to grasp man on his own level. Man is reduced to non-man, the political to the sub-political. The philosophers are alienated from the human things, which only poetry can reproduce. And I could go on with that uh, beautiful yeah. essay, but I'll stop it there. Yeah. Um, how, yeah. do you how do you respond to that? It reminds me a lot of what, you, what you're talking about with the cave allegory. Yeah, g great question, Jordan. And um, Blue, Alan Bloom was, in my view, a, just a beautiful writer, beautiful thinker. Uh, the closing of the American mind yeah. was really my turning point. That changed my life. That book. Towards liberal education. Yeah, it, it just it's another story. But um, and so I think his essay in the back. That's why I rec partly why I recommend his his edition of that book because your listeners may be thinking after this i hope i want to read that book and i remember reading just a dime store translation uh after on my own after i'd read blooms uh close the american mind i didn't know he had a translation yeah. and it was very difficult i really just did not know what was going on <laughs> it's very hard you, you can't That's just me. say <laughs> say read this book and uh you'll be changed it takes a lot of patience, and yeah. I think it takes some direction and guidance. And so Bloom gives you that. It's a real gift, uh, his addition. That being said, Bloom has a conception of philosophy that I think is controversial and somewhat pivotal. So pivotal in the sense that um, it, 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 it forces you to sort of make a decision one way or another how you think about the achievements of philosophy. If you read the closing of the American mind between the lines, um, it, it's funny that the book was really embraced by evangelicals when it came out um, as a kind of defense of, of what they held to be true. And there's a lot to that. But if you read between the lines and closing the American mind, uh, what you see is that what the philosopher, what Bloom's philosopher ultimately discovers is that his particular life is meaningless and that the cosmos is indifferent to human life, that uh, a personal God is unlikely, certainly a relational God is unlikely, that arguably elements of the mechanistic view of nature and the world are true, and so the philosopher ends up what, what characterizes a philosopher is not any acquired insight into uh, what is true, good, and beautiful, but just a kind of pleasure of erotic desire to know and you know, to, to pursue the big questions and at least just 
to know that they're not deceived by the myths. Right. And so that's clearly not the Plato that, say, the church fathers pick up on or that the Neoplatonists pick mm, up on. Right. And so th this is just kind of a question to pay attention. Nor, nor is that my Plato, though I think you know, I can see how Bloom could read Plato this way. I, I don't, I, I think it's a particularly Nietzschean way of reading Plato. Right, that, that makes uh, a lot of sense, because what I get from that passage is, he is saying the philosopher is one who is able to see through the, the myths, there's someone who is able to see through the mythos, and, but, but my question for Bloom is, well, what then? What next? And for Nietzsche, exactly. it's, it's, well, okay, fine, but how do I create my own values? Right. That's that. that is, so we you know, we could do a whole podcast on Alan Bloom, and and it would be fruitful. But for, for all of Bloom's incredibly rich insights, I think at the end of the day, he has um, something of an agnostic, uh, po possibly Nietzschean read on Plato. Now, my view is that doesn't have to. Uh, undermine all the great insights and things that just you know, that just leap off the page yeah. of, of Bloom's essay. Of and by the way, that does I don't think that sullies his interpretation either. His translation, I mean, uh, that is Bloom's view is what he tries to do is to be accurate and consistent in his translation. So the same words he translates the same way mm -hmm. each time. He tries to avoid using idiomatic expressions uh, in the translation. And then he adds footnotes to sort of say what the words are that he's translating. And so you feel like he's, as much as possible, trying to remove himself from the translation. He's not trying to assert, through his translation, his own philosophy, uh, I don't think. But I guess what I would say is that, um, on the one hand, there, there's something hugely important about what Plato's doing in the Republic. The, the, the poet that rules the Republic is Homer, with Hesiod as well. And uh, what Socrates seems to be arguing is Hesiod and Homer are not very good poets for human flourishing because look at how they depict the gods. Uh, the gods are fighting with each other, having sex with each other, having adultery, right. having, you know, uh, fornicating with human beings, starting wars. These are just not very godlike gods. Right. And insofar as human beings imitate the highest things, um, these are not good models. Nor are their heroes good models. Look at what Achilles does. He's, you know, he gets grumpy. He, uh, he abandons his people because uh, he thinks he's been slighted. And then when Patroclus gets killed, what does he do? He slaves Hector and drags his body around <laughs> yeah. for three days with a chariot. That's yeah. not very good. He's, you know, th this is a song about the anger of Achilles, and Achilles just probably is not a good model for a hero. So what we need is a mythos which tells the truth about the gods. That's what he says. And some of the truths that he suggests should be there are uh, God never lies. Uh, and he, d he never says whether God exists or not, I don't know. He just said, uh, he assumes God exists the whole time. I think he... Uh, argues he, he argues in places that gods must exist, and they're not going to be lying gods. Uh, he even suggests that there must be one, one god, multiple god. He hints at that, that that having plural gods in some way is incompatible with divinity. So, you know, my sense is that you can te that, that that you can make that Socrates that Plato makes a lot more sense. To me, he makes a lot more sense if he's understood in a more pious and theological way than in Bloom's more nihilistic way. Um, the, the, but that's, again, a long, longer conversation. I'm inclined to think that the, that the church fathers are understanding Plato in this respect more accurately than Bloom is, though I do think that maybe they take the Neoplatonism a little too far. And so if you have time for one last question, I'd, I'd love to just uh, round this interview out by asking you, what do you think that Plato 
but that reading Plato, the, the early dialogues and, and reading Plato's Republic, and maybe you could extend this out to philosophy in general, what, what would reading Plato help us with today? Um, how, how could Plato help us in our contentious political climate? Um, what would Plato say about our academy? Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, obviously that that's a great question too. You're asking good questions, very Platonic questions, Socratic <laughs> questions, which means they need a they need books mm. to be answered adequately. Right. One thing that immediately comes to my mind is that reading Plato reminds us of the pleasure, richness of transpolitical things. I think one of the dangers of our time is over politicization. Yes. We are, we are so yes. caught up in and anxious about winning and losing and and fighting and trying trying to win out our inch of ter- political territory that we Forget that politics is not an end in itself. It's at the service of something greater than politics, the trans-political. Right. And and I think also we Americans, Plato saw this, the danger of democracy, uh, is that we are, equality makes us very anxious about uh, our ability to provide for ourselves and others. It, sim- it simultaneously makes us proud because no one is sort of naturally better than us, but it also makes us very anxious because uh, now the sort of nets that we might have relied on once to sort of support us are gone. We've got to do it all ourselves. So we've got this anxious, what I'm talking about here is really the sort of anxious drive that Americans have to work, right? Yep. To, to pursue useful careers, to make money. Yeah. to be successful and let's be honest these things when we when we give them when we obsess about them they make us deeply unhappy yes i just saw in the paper yesterday that suicide rates had gone up i think again yes they in have america for the second year in a row yep. and that that's a stunning piece of data right you've got the one of the wealthiest most prosperous countries in the world and people are killing themselves more often and life expectancy has gone gone down again for the second year in a row exactly a lot of that has to with has to do with opioid abuse and and these other things again that just begs the question why why are we uh doing this and uh there are lots of reasons they're complex but i think uh plato reading plato reminds us of the good of leisure leisure is not just hanging out not working I mean the leisure of pursuing what is truly rich and meaningful that we yes. hunger for. So he does that. Just on the face of it, it's just rich to do that. But I would just say secondly that uh, Plato, in his writing, substantively provides us th- th- a deep knowledge about human nature, about the scope and limits of human longing, human desire, a full picture about our desire for love, about our fear of death, about our, our, our longing for transcendence, about the limits of the body, these things that we just don't want to pay any attention to do you know, to today. They're just sort of off our field, but they're so present to us, right? In our experience, yeah. we don't have any fora, we don't have any means for thinking about and making sense of and talking about the things that are so deeply present in us. We all want to love and to be loved. We all fear death in some way we all are insecure so we're just sort of we're all a mess of anxious longing and <laughs> yeah. plato can help us understand that in a really deep way okay thank you very much for being on the program that was great uh dr schluter and i hope that you'll join me again i would love to have that discussion about bloom um or if there's any other uh area of expertise that you have i'd love to have you on again thank you for having me on and thank you for all your good work and thank you for promoting Hillsdale and the, the other good places you're promoting and for promoting Study of the Great Books, which I think is wonderful. So I really appreciate that. Anytime. Come back soon. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Jordan. Take care. Bye-bye.